Commencement chapter with, along with my um, wonderful co-chair, Angela Easterwood. And we're excited about the BEC Bosman. Anybody here from BEC Bosman? Ah, oh, you're in the house. I love it. I love it. So thank you for being here again. I really appreciate you weathering this heat to come out to be a part of this, uh, our peace rally, the uh, BEC annual Juneteenth rally. Today I'm standing before you to present to you Maya Jones. Maya Jones is the Labor and Industry Co-Chair of the NAACP Arlington Chapter. Woo and so she's going to take us uh, a little further in, in our rally. And if you can, make sure you hydrate, 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 get yourself some water, get yourself some snacks, and by all means, I don't blame you for staying in the shade. But again, thank you for being here. And now I present to you Maya Jones. Juneteenth Peaceful Protest, and I'm even more excited that this year's theme is Lift Every Voice. I care so much about voting, um, and it's something that I've done in every single election, primary, big or small, since I was a very young age. So I'm just really excited to be here with you all. Um, this year is the first year, I think, since Congress ha passed um, Juneteenth as a federal holiday. That is shows the change that we have in our country. If we thought about five years ago, most of us didn't know what it is. And on this Juneteenth, like many days where we celebrate the black community, we are celebrating black excellence, the freedom of our people, but also the complicated relationship that black people have with our country. So as you know, Juneteenth is when the last enslaved people living in Galveston, Texas, learned they were no longer someone else's property. Let that sink in for a moment. Imagine the massive weight that comes with learning your life is your own, that your child's life is now their own, that their destiny is inside of their own hands, um, and that your voice may finally be heard. But also, think about the fact that you are still treated as less than a human being that people still discriminate against you and that they're still killing you in large numbers. As we take in all this, I want to provide you with three important reflections. The first is the term slaves is not only a dehumanizing description, it is an improper description described to describe those individuals. I, like many black Americans, am a descendant of African people who were forcefully taken from their homes forced to live in a country they had never been to before, and then forced into sl slavery and servitude. While they endured those deplorable conditions, being enslaved is not the identity of the black community. Our ancestors were mothers, they were fathers, they were children, they were agricultural leaders and artists and artisans. They were bankers and warriors, and most importantly, they were loving, wholesome people. We cannot sit idly by and watch people dehumanize our ancestry and dehumanize people by reducing them down to a simple word, slaves. We must remember that Juneteenth is a celebration of their humanity, and we must vote so that there are people are remembered in our history books. The second thing we must reflect on is the insignificance of this newfound freedom. While they were no longer property, each person did not have as many clothing and did not have access to food or shelter, and most could not read or write. But despite that, they taught themselves, they built schoolhouses and churches, and they started businesses to improve their life conditions. And Congress decided that they needed to pass some laws, namely, you know, reconstruction policies, to try to prevent that from happening and to prevent people from returning to slave-like conditions. While Congress provided 40 acres and a mule to each person, that was technically reparations. And Congress never said that that was against our Constitution. Congress also wanted to codify that 
by passing the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and we know that the 13th Amendment outlawed slavery, and the 14th provided that someone could not withhold a person's right to life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness without due process of the law, and the 15th removed the ability to restrict voting based upon someone's race. Sadly, those ideals were just ideals, and Congress never lived up to any of it. They never provided the 40 acres to a mule to most of the people. And just after Reconstruction, states enacted Jim Crow laws that effectively outlawed voting until the 1960s. And still today, Congress uses the 14th Amendment to prevent reparations or anything else um, to provide the ancestry of those people. And we cannot stand for that, and we must vote so that we can start to change those things, so that we can finally use our voices that they were denied. The last reflection I have is the right to vote is a right that the founders and even post-Civil War congressmen found necessary to ensure people were represented and not taken advantage of by our government. And, to pre and preventing that participation motivates people to motivates people to provide representation without progress. Anti-democracy politicians know that voting is effective and they know that voting works, which is why they do not want you to use your voice and they do not want you to go to the ballot because if you vote, they might not be there to continue to prevent progress. Our democracy has always struggled to empower all people, and the cycle of voting rights has always been a constant battle of expansions and retractions. Right now, people still believe that some people do not deserve to vote. They still believe that black people don't deserve to vote. And the real truth is, they are afraid of our democracy, and they are afraid that voting works. They are terrified of your voice, because they know that when black men voted during Reconstruction, black elected officials started to fill courthouses and started to fill state legislators. And they passed progressive policies that everybody was in support of. Jim Crow was a backlash to that success, a backlash to Reconstruction, just as voter suppression is now a backlash to the success of the Voting Rights Act. In Virginia in 2021, when the state removed voting barriers, we saw citizens vote. That's exactly why we need to remove voting barriers. And now, people are afraid that they will lose their seats if the people vote. And they want to make it harder in hopes that the good people of the Commonwealth of Virginia decide not to exercise their right to vote. Now, we must fight to prevent voter suppression, and we cannot stand for the closing of our polling locations and the restrictions on voting hours, because that is modern day voter intimidation. We cannot stand for voter ID laws, creating monetary requirements for ballot access, because that is the modern poll tax. And we cannot stand for poll workers, and I love our poll workers, being able to toss out ballots based off of contrived signature rules, because that's the modern literacy test. Voter suppression tactics are not new. They mirror actions taken throughout our history to prevent poor people, to prevent women, and to prevent ethnic and racial minorities from voting. We cannot stand for that, and we must vote to prevent that from happening again in the Commonwealth of Virginia. On June 21st, Virginia has our primary election. We must turn out in full force to determine who our party nominees will be, and we must turn out again on Tuesday, November 8th, because we have to share our voice in our democracy. So with this, I'll leave you with three simple tasks. The first is find your polling location and vote. The second is if you aren't registered, now is the time. Go register, it's super quick, it's super easy, and you will be able to exercise your right. Um, third, you need to register three friends and three family members because without their support, we will not see the change we need to see because it really takes a village in order to have those types of policies. So many things remain on the line in this election, such as our economy, education, voting rights, 
and your access to health care. And you must vote because your vote is your voice and your voice is your power. Thank you. My roots ain't always been this kinky. Quite literally and metaphorically, you see, freedom ain't always free. And I wish somebody would have told me that the cost of liberation requires release to be fruitful in mental gestation, shedding old ways of thinking to create space for things anew to my, to my enslaved mind, I bid you adieu. My walk ain't always been this prideful. And they say pride is a sin, but what about when you find your blackness in this white world we live in? Black women live with restrictions, repeated infliction, because we fit the description of an enemy based solely on our identity. So I won't apologize for this pride. Makes my feet plant differently on soil my ancestors have been buried in beneath me. Mother Earth, we honor thee. My voice ain't always had this presence. You were lucky if you even knew I was present a silence so loud the winds whispered ancestral sounds avenging their suffering. They leave me wondering about my shortcomings. How do I resist? The air whispers, baby, just continue to exist. When you're tired, persist. And always use your voice when you raise your right fist. Speak your truth no matter who it bothers. Child, channel your inner Maxine Waters. Okay? Woo. My feelings, they always flow this freely. When emotional instability runs all in the family, healing out loud is less than pretty. You gotta accept responsibility if you're trying to move your way up like George and Weezy. Different strokes, I guess. But I digress. Reminder to self. Feel what you feel, just drip it in finesse. These days, my soul is on fire because I answered the call to vibrate higher. From relaxer to retwist, individual to collectivist, thus hatred to womanist, allow me to repeat this. My roots ain't always been this king. I mean, the more my eyes open, the less I can see. When I think I understand, I lack clarity. And although these elements have guided me, I can never unsee the tangled web we weave. Is BEC Parks Lead, my girl Tasha Green, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. I'm about to give me somebody now. How y'all doing today? From Lee Highway to Langston Boulevard. The 26 page educational book was written to inform children about the importance and meaning of representation and naming. Everyone, give your applause to Nadia, Nadia Conyers. to ensure justice and equality when it comes to names and representation. 
Just like those communities, my childhood neighborhood came together to change the name of Lee Highway to Langston Boulevard. My mother, Sandra Green, was very instrumental in the community work group that met for over a year to make sure this remaining happened. In excitement, my family and I discussed the renaming of Lee Highway to Langston Boulevard frequently. During one of these discussions, my daughter chimed in and asked, why are they changing the name? And who is John in Langston? When I began my search to find appropriate literature on renaming, why representation matters, and books on recent renaming, my search came back void. In that instance, my daughter and I decided we would write a children's book for parents and their children, highlighting the importance of representation. This book was also written to highlight the significant contributions to society by John M. Langston, a lesser known black history figure. Our hope is that this book brings families together and opens the conversation around why words matter, names matter, and representation matters. Arrington and I, Arrington is her last day of school, and she said, Mommy, I have to go to the party. All of my friends will miss me. <laughs> and so I said, I understand. She said, just tell all the people to go buy the book. It's on Amazon. I said, I got you, babe. We'll do that. Um, but just to let you know, we are starting a uh, Arlington Heritage Awareness Project. And our project, Arrington and I's project, is to get a copy of From Lee Highway to Langston Boulevard into the hands of children who need to see their own faces in the literature the most. Arlington County, Virginia has eight Title I elementary schools, which are located in low-income and impoverished areas where students do not have easy access to literature or writing that accurately depicts them. It is also our desire to host a read-aloud of From Likely Highway to Langston Boulevard at each of the eight of these elementary schools. Our goal is to ensure that these read aloud events are open to all students, including but not limited to those who have been historically underrepresented based on race and ethnicity. These events will encourage and build culture consciousness and curiosity among students and adults and celebrate diversity in children's literature and storytelling. We will also plan to uh, donate more than 20 books to each Arlington County Elementary School to celebrate diversity in each school. These books in this section will be called the mirror corner of each section of the library. If you would like to contribute to these mirror corners where our children can see representation of themselves in literature, please come see me in the back. I also have copies of our book. This is important. There are more animals in books than people of color. If you can't see yourself in it, how can you be it? And so, I have the distinguished honor now um, of introducing someone who I admire, someone who I have grown up watching, um, and someone who is also a fellow um, neighbor in Hoss Hill, Highview Park, one of the best neighborhoods in Arlington. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Hoss Hill? Okay. You'll, you'll learn about us today. <laughs> Kitty Clark Stevenson is a human resources management professional with over 50 years of experience in the fields of mid and senior level management and human resources management. Kitty is president and owner of Abilene Consulting LLC, celebrating its 42nd year of awareness training, sexual and other forms of workplace harassment, diversity, affirmative employment, and organizational development initiatives. Her company also provides private consulting services to individuals seeking resolution to complaints of unlawful discrimination claims. She is a certified windmills trainer and trained persons with disabilities, managers, employees, and personnel specialists, specialists on disability awareness and sensitivity issues. She served in Arlington County, Virginia government for 15 years as a Selective Placement Program Manager, developing and implementing employment programs for persons with disabilities, serving as Arlington's first, serving as Arlington's first full-time EEO officer. All right, okay. 
Podium, the illustrious Kitty Clark Stevenson. Woo! 